Great. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Sue Siglowski, please, if you want to join us at the table. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. It's a new group of faces here in Center of Education. For those of you that do not know, Sue Siglowski is the executive director of the Vermont School Boards Association. Ben, how long have you been in that position, I ask? I have been in that position for a little over three years, and I've been with the association for five years. Okay. Yeah. And I can speak to her knowledge and expertise, and uh, great to have you here. Thank you yeah. very much. So we've asked you to come in and talk just a little bit, you know, introduce yourself, give us some updates on what you're seeing and hearing from school board members, particularly with an eye toward COVID recovery, uh, and things in general, and some of your priorities for this, this year. Absolutely. So for the record, I'm Sue Siglowski, Executive Director of the Vermont School Boards Association. Um, thank you very much for inviting me in. And uh, I'd like to start just by briefly talking about the role of school boards because it's really important to understand um, school boards' role when we talk about uh, the work of the VSBA and also our priorities. So um, as most of you probably know, school boards are not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of schools. Um, we always say to school board members um, that it's their job to make sure that schools are um, well run. It's not their job to actually run the school. And so um, they provide student-focused oversight and assure delivery of an effective education program in their communities at a reasonable cost for their taxpayers. And so that, um, in a nutshell, is what their, um, their job is. There are six areas of responsibility that of school boards in Vermont. The first is to engage the community to establish a vision for the school district. And this is a really um, important aspect of school board service. Um, they also adopt policies, um, and their policies oftentimes are um, aligning with that vision that they have. They hire the superintendent and establish clear expectations for the superintendent. Um, they develop a budget, which a lot of them are working on right now, finishing up um, their budgets to be presented to the voters. And they provide financial oversight throughout the year on that budget. They monitor progress towards the vision, so it's not um, enough just to establish a vision, but um, they need to make sure that um, progress is being made toward that. Um, and then lastly, operate in an ethical and effective manner, and that um, relates to things like uh, conflict of interest. So we like to say that serving on a school board is upholding the great American tradition of a free public education for all, and this tradition forms the foundation of our democracy, a well-informed citizenry. It's extremely important, as you all know, for students to develop critical and independent thinking and um, that they understand how history can impact our future. Uh, so simply put, education is crucial for the future of our state and school boards play an important role in the system. A little bit about the VSBA. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we were founded in 1961. The vision and mission of our organization has evolved over time, and just this past year, the VSBA Board of Directors went through a comprehensive strategic planning process to develop a new vision and mission. And as part of that process, they um, developed eight beliefs and I'm not going they're they're all in my written testimony I'm not going to go through all of them but there were a few that I um, just three that I wanted to highlight one is that public education is the foundation of and for democracy another is public education in Vermont is critically important for a healthy democracy is the engine that drives economic development and is the core of a strong community and then um, third School boards and their communities need to understand the jobs, roles, and responsibilities of school boards and their members. And boards need to have professional development to be effective and efficient in their roles. So that is a, um, a very important uh, focus of ours, um, always, and specifically um, now. These eight beliefs are the foundation on which the vision and mission are built. Uh, the vision is that VSBA is a trusted leadership organization advancing the essential work of Vermont school boards so that each and every student is supported in their educational journey. 
we used to have much longer vision and so it's nice to have it be uh, one sentence. <laughs> um, and then the mission is also one sentence, um, which is develop and provide systems and resources that support school boards and their members informed through inclusive community engagement. The VSBA is a membership organization and um, an important point is that we understand that not all school board members see every issue the same way. The SBA has clear processes for taking positions as an organization, and um, it's possible you're gonna hear from individual school board members who have a different perspective. And we welcome all school board members to share their views with VSBA and also with all of you. Uh, the VSBA has a 24 member board of directors. There's a president, immediate past president, and 22 regional representatives. We have 11 regions and two representatives from each region of the state. Um, the current president is Neil O'Dell of Norwich, um, and you may see him come in here and testify on, um, on issues before your committee. The VSBA is governed by uh, bylaws, resolutions, and policies. And I'll just take a minute to talk about resolutions. These are positions taken by the association on issues that are important to Vermont school boards. They can include recommendations for actions by the VSBA. They could also include recommendations for actions by the legislature. Um, they are guidance for our staff and board um, when they're working in the public policy arena or also developing programs and services for our members. Um, and important to know about our resolutions is that they're voted on at our annual meeting by membership. And so, so we typically have our annual meeting in October. Uh, new resolutions passed by VSBA membership in October of 2022 covered the following topics, public funds accountability, district quality standards, funds to assist school districts with PCB and radon remediation, and universal meals. And so when I come in and testify to your committee on, um, on these topics, I'll provide the specific language of the resolution that was passed in my written testimony. And I provided a link to the full list of um, resolutions in, in my written testimony today if you'd like to um, take a look at them. If there is not a resolution on the topic that I'm coming in to testify about, I get direction from either the VSBA board or its legislative committee. So that is the process that we use. Uh, we are a small organization. There's only four full-time staff, including me. Uh, and with me today is Sandra Cameron, the Associate Executive Director. And you'll see Sandra um, in here um, quite often. We also have uh, Phil Gore, who is the Director of Board Services, and Carrie Lamb, who's the Director of Operations. Now I'll talk a little bit about the services um, and resources for our members. Um, Senator Campion, I know you, I, um, Hayden mentioned that you had some questions about um, training for new board members and, and existing board members, so that this, that's where I'll cover this. Um, we, we provide many training opportunities for school board members, including monthly webinars, which are free for our members, um, workshops on the essential work of Vermont school boards. We provide board retreats, customized board development, where um, we will uh, have a meeting with the board chair and anyone else on the board who um, wants to participate about what the needs of the board are and then develop um, our program specifically to meet those needs. Um, we also offer uh, workshops on team building and advancing educational equity. We have a lot of resources online on our website. Um, we also hold an annual conference in the fall for school board members and we have regional meetings um, in our 11 regions where we share best practices and um, foster a learning community among school board members. Our resources and services have long been informed, as um, I say, by best practices, research, and examples from across Vermont, and thought it would be important to note that we're updating our curriculum this year to support a school board's success in meeting and exceeding the upcoming district governance standards. I'm not sure if anyone um, has talked to your, commu your committee yet about the governance standards. So in um, last year in Act 127, which was the waiting study bill, 
there was um, a requirement that each Vermont school district meet school district quality standards um, adopted by the rule of the agency of education. And those had to cover business, facilities management, and governance practices of school districts. Um, so the Secretary of Education contacted VSBA over the summer and asked us to develop draft governance standards um, for his consideration to be incorporated into those newly required district quality standards. So this past summer and fall, the VSBA did this work by convening a task force of 11 school board members from across the state. Um, before outlining their work, the task force met with the secretary and he provided them um, with some guidance of what he was looking for. And um, then they spent a significant amount of time this fall meeting, conducting their work. They reviewed national research on best practices and governance, um, particularly those studies relating to how school boards can affect student outcomes and close achievement gaps. Uh, they invited input, input from publicly elected school board members, superintendents, and representatives from the Act One working group. The final version of the proposed draft standards was approved by the full VSBA board in November, and uh, we then sent it to Secretary French, and uh, he has included it in his draft um, district quality standards without any um, changes as far as I am aware. It recognizes that effective governance by school boards is an essential, essential component in district quality, and it um, outlines three categories for effective governance. Those are priorities, protocols, and processes. And um, I provided a link in your testimony to the document that we submitted to the secretary. Uh, next, consulting services. Can we just pause there? Yes, yeah, sure. If anybody has any questions about training in particular. Absolutely. I think the only thing that I was gonna ask is, do you have a sense of the percentage of people, percentage of school board members that go through training? Because it is optional. Right, it is optional. Uh, I, I could try to, um, to get that data for you. We do keep track of who, who participates, but there's no, as you say, there's no requirement mm -hmm. that they do. Uh, the only thing that is required is um, under 16 VSA, I think it's 561B, the superintendent and board chair are required to do eight hours of training annually. And again, that's not um, tra really tracked or enforced um, sure. by the state, but um, there's specific areas that that training is supposed to cover such as educational leadership, open meeting law, public records act, um, collective bargaining, and there's a couple other things in there as well. Um, so we, we provide that training, um, that joint training for um, superintendents and board chairs and um, get, a, I would say, a pretty good participation rate in that training. I hate to have you waste your time, but if you could, I'm just trying to get a guesstimate, like, is it 25%? You know, I don't want you to sit there and count, but if you could come back with some kind of just idea of who you're, you know, what kind of, you know, are you getting folks or, or not? Yeah, that, I'd be happy that, to that do that. That would be great. Yeah, 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 yeah be I'd be great. happy to do that. And we do also offer um, training specifically for new board members, mm -hmm. and that really focuses on their role and um, on the six areas that I spoke about at the beginning of my testimony. Um, so that's that we really encourage all new board members to do that training because when uh, it's really um, a, a lot to get up to speed on when you join the school board. So. The other thing I should mention is that every single new board member, um, as long as they're a member of the VSBA, gets this book um, that we revise every uh, couple of years to keep it up to date and it's the essential work of Vermont school boards and it's got a lot of um, valuable information in it. Senator Lee. Just a curiosity question on the training availability. You say so every new member and, and such. What about the candidate, you know, going backwards a couple of steps? Because lots of folks want to get involved. They're not quite sure what they're getting involved in. And, um, you know, school boards are no different. That, right. uh, you know, if the, again, if the training were available or, the, you know, to gain those insights, it could be, um, could, could get them better prepared for their essential duties, and if, they don't, if they're not successful with the campaign, at least they understand uh, the board process better. 
Yes, that's true. Senator Reese, really for great. example, would have run years ago and I didn't realize <laughs> that this is what Senate education was coming. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we do have a web page for prospective school board members, okay. and um, but that's something that you, the idea that you put out there is something we've been. Um, talking about and um, hope to do, which is a webinar for people who want to run for school board so that they um, can learn more about it. Good. So, Thanks. yes. We've been talking about this recruitment idea to get teachers here, kind of goes along the same lines. Is there, do you, uh, at least in Bennington, sometimes there's a, hey, who's gonna run? Who, you know, can we yes. fill this spot? And I don't know if there's any kind of thought to getting it out there more, I don't know how to do it, but to, to really put some kind of recruitment document together, say, come serve on your school board, you know, help build up our democracy, uh, help young kids, that kind of thing. Yeah, we do have a brochure that we send out to the town offices uh, that people can pick up. We also have a, a public service announcement um, that we that is on that prospective board members website. But I'm afraid um, in like 10 yes, years, we're, like young people aren't going to even know what a brochure is. I know, you know? I know. And it's all this, you know, so. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, I, but yeah. Yeah, we probably should be using social media to get it out there. Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow. Yeah. It's, it's, hard, it's hard enough to get volunteers <laughs> to do anything about I the know. government. So if you can make it a requirement, you're going to maybe turn some people off that might You mean the training them. requirement? Yeah. 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 That's mm -hmm. a fair point. Yeah. yeah so some, it's good some, that it's optional. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Some states make it required and um, others don't. It kind of varies across the nation. Any more questions, Any questions on, on this part? Okay. okay, I'll just briefly touch on consulting services. Um, we support boards with operational and management challenges. So if they have a um, particular problem they're having, um, we will help them try to navigate through that. Um, also strategic planning, which is a really important um, aspect of board and um, not enough boards um, do it. Um, and then we have specialized services available to help them with superintendent searches, <coughs> superintendent evaluations, um, and if they use uh, policy governance, we have uh, inf information for them about that as well. So I'm ask you a question about the, the consulting piece yeah. around strategic planning. You know, closing these achievement gaps, you know, we've seen these test scores well before COVID started even out. I mean, is there a way and perhaps this is going to be coming to us in, a, in some of those, something that we've asked the agency to, to kind of provide for us. But is there almost, I'm just thinking, when we do like renewable energy policy, we have town plans, we have, we have things that say, we don't want this here, we want it there. Is there a way for us to get kind of super focused on schools and say, hey, this is this school's or this district, this is how they're going to close their achievement gap? I think that the district quality standards sure. are going to okay. help with some of that. Help with that, okay. yes. Yeah. Uh, next is legal and policy services. This is a really important aspect of what we do. Um, of course, we can't really we can't provide uh, legal representation to school districts, but if they have general legal questions, um, we can often point them in the right direction. Uh, we give them updates on changes to the law. Uh, we provide legal training for boards and superintendents, um, for example, on the open meeting law, which is a really important aspect of law for them to understand. Um, and then we also publish model school board policies. We have uh, over 50 of them. Those are on our website if you um, want to take a look at them. Some of them are uh, what we call required. Those are the ones where um, you or the four um, Congress has said that they must have a policy, um, and there are many of those. Um, in addition, there are some others that we recommend, and those are on, on our website. Um, next is communications. We keep all our members up to date on what's happening um, here in the legislature um, while you're doing your work, and then at the end, we do a final comprehensive legislative report that lets them know these are the changes to education law that have happened this year. Um, we send them weekly update emails every Tuesday um, throughout the year. We've always got something that we need to um, make sure that they know about. Um, for instance, yesterday um, when I sent the weekly update email, we included H42 that the, the House passed yesterday. Senator Williams. Can, that, can you go back to you don't provide legal service, but 
do they have, uh, most towns have a attorney on, uh, like they do for the, for the select board, for right. example. How about the, um, the model league of cities and towns, do you work with them at all for, do, are they interface at all with the school boards? Um, they don't interface directly with school boards, but um, we do communicate with them quite often on um, different yeah. legislative issues and that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's not really their lane. But right. Yeah. They're sort of like the equivalent, we're sort of like their equivalent for school boards. We right. do for school boards okay. what they do for towns. I guess that's what I was fishing yeah. for. Yes. Uh, commun on communications, I also wanted to mention that we published the education law book, and that's a green book that has all of um, the pertinent education laws for Vermont. We do that annually. This year, our publication is a little bit held up by our um, publisher, but it should be coming out um, soon. I know everybody's been waiting for that, and then I already mentioned this essential work of Vermont school boards. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about educational equity because that's an extremely important um, part of our work. Uh, we're, we have a definition of education equity that's in our model equity policy. And um, we have collaborated with two consultant teams to address educational equity in a variety of ways. One of them helped us with, our, um, with 11 of our model policies, um, working on some language changes in them. And the other one provided real-time support to board chairs and superintendents that had um, challenging situations that they were facing. Uh, and it was really quite valuable. We've also um, provided some webinars to advance equity through um, those same consultants and also through Outright Vermont. Um, in addition to providing these resources, we're currently developing a curriculum and related materials for school boards to support their work in analyzing and responding to data on student achievement outcomes. So that um, relates back to what your previous question, I think, Chair Campion, too, about uh, looking at outcomes and how can we close the gap. Yep. Somewhat uh, related on the equity issue. Um, I don't know if you were in here when we were talking a little bit about some of our priorities and we were looking at it. Again, it's not necessarily a rural urban divide, but there are a lot of small schools that don't have the same thing, mm -hmm. same offerings. And I wonder if you could say a few words on that. You having probably one of the best views out there of the whole state, what sort of discrepancies exist? For you know, and I can be more specific. How serious is the problem that some kids can just go to high school and get one class of Spanish, they can go to another high school and get five, you know, foreign language offerings? You've had a kid that all he or she wants to do is study calculus, but it only goes to algebra, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Do you do you have specific data about that? I, mean, I really don't. That's why I'm, I'm, that. I'm wondering if you have some of that. That's what we're trying to pull apart. Is there yeah. a big problem there, or are we? I mean, anecdotally, uh, I, it's, I've heard concerns, and years ago, you probably remember when Tom Sullivan was the president of UVM, it went around here a lot, the kid that didn't get into UVM because the school only offered two years and a half, right. uh, and they, of course, made an exception to the rule, but can you give a sense, is that a problem out there? I would love to see some data on okay. that, because I, I don't... Um, I don't think I'm able to respond without okay. being able to look at that. But um, I can tell you that if the, if it is, um, if there is a big discrepancy, yeah. um, one of the things that I think is going to help is the district quality standards. Um, and I also think um, it's going to be interesting to see how the implementation of the new weights plays out mm -hmm. and whether um, those, that helps to um, level the playing field. Yeah, yes, and it I think, I think your point kind of goes back to what I said for one of my priorities is that Act 60, mm -hmm. which was the Equity in Education Bill, I think it, over the years, that was 1979, that maybe we've kind of gotten away from, from that. And that's a, that's a law that's been through the Supreme Court of Brigham versus State. And we keep rewriting the definition of equity. Um, it, what that did to a lot of the schools that had excellent programs uh, so that they were equal they, throughout. 
they I don't think they intended to tear down schools with a good program, but it tried to make the curriculum equal across the board and and all the uh, financial aid. Uh, I think that we have, and I think we're going to talk about it. Yeah. Act 60, yeah. right? Yeah. 60 and 68. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, it's, a, it's an interesting history, and I don't know, I don't remember what was sort of there before, but I am concerned that what's there now does need beefing up, and how, again, you know, if you happen to be born in a certain area, you know, uh, you know how do you make sure that, you know, you get what you need, basically? Yeah. So, okay. Yes. Uh, last on equity, I just wanted to uh, let you know that we've been awarded grant funds to develop an affinity group for school board members. Um, and the, it, the purpose of an affinity group is to share stories, experiences, and ideas, and provide a space for school board members across the state to network and make connections on issues of educational equity. Uh, and our first affinity group is going to bring together school board members who are black indigenous people of color. So we're excited to um, get started on that. Uh, next is uh, the last of our services to our members is advocacy. So the VSBA uh, pro uh, provides representation of its membership, um, which I should mention is over 900 locally elected school board members um, in the General Assembly and also um, in public policy development with the Agency of Education and the State Board and various other education organizations. And um, at times we're also tasked by the General Assembly to be a member of um, task force groups and advisory councils and the like. Getting toward the end of my testimony and wanted to provide you with some information about our priorities for this legislative session. Um, first, I wanted to highlight the significant facilities needs across the state. The state hasn't provided support for school construction since um, 2007, I believe, and it's really starting to show in the condition of our school buildings. Um, and though that condition is causing significant health and safety issues in some places. And really, it's also an equity issue because some school districts are able to garner the um, local community support to pass a bond to do renovations or construction, and others are not able to do that. Um, and research shows that the quality of school facilities impacts student achievement. So comes right back to your question, Chair Campion. I think there's so Just many send me that aspects. research. Yeah. That'd be great. Yep. Yeah. Um, so inequities in school buildings can lead to inequities for students. Along with serious concerns about the general condition of school buildings, the VSBA advocates that the legislature allocate funds to assist school districts with PCB and radon remediation when contamination is identified under state mandated testing. Um, and we wanted to make sure um, to include that because that's one of the resolutions that was passed by our members at the annual meeting. Uh, second, I wanted to draw your attention to the increasing mental health needs of Vermont students. And this topic has been mentioned by several other witnesses, so I'm not going to go into any great detail, but we certainly do hope that you will take the mental health needs into account when considering how to handle any excess in the education fund Rather than returning that money to taxpayers to reduce property tax rates, we recommend using it to provide um, facilities aid and to address the mental health needs of Vermont's students. Um, additionally, since it appears that the surplus exists at least partially due to lower special education spending, please consider um, using part of it to help school districts address their special education needs. Um, I've heard a, from a lot of school board members um, about their districts facing challenges under the new census block funding for special education that was implemented with Act 173, um, specifically that the um, block grants are substantially less than expected and causing them to actually have to eliminate some positions. And finally, VSBA advocates ensuring educational equity in the wake of the United States Supreme Court's decision in Carson v. Lincoln. The most recent VSBA resolution related to this topic passed in October of 2022 at the annual meeting. The resolution calls for public funds accountability and adv advocates that all rules, regulations, policies, quality standards, reporting requirements, and laws regarding 
public schools in Vermont must apply to any school that receives funds from the statewide education fund for any reason or for any purpose. That's um, directly from the resolution. As part of the Education Equity Alliance, the SBA supports the values of equity, transparency, and accountability, and we're open to any reforms that align with these values and that pass Supreme Court muster. And with that, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today, and we certainly look forward to working with you during the upcoming session. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Questions for Sue? I just want to say, and I'm not just saying this because the executive director is here and the assistant executive director, but this is just an unbelievably wonderful organization. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I, it's one of the most high functioning organizations I've ever been a part of. Um, it's well run, it's student focused and student centered and we often don't agree with each other, but we're very uh, respectful. And because it's such a high functioning group, it's, you know, we get stuff done and we get it done in a really uh, collaborative way. So I just wanted to make that plug. Um, but I also, as a school board member, have found their resources to be so incredibly helpful. I must have watched your little 12 minute video on school funding like 25 times, just <laughs> over and over and over again until it was like, okay, I think I got this. So those resources, but also, um, you know, a lot of folks get on school boards and immediately feel like they just want to like take over and fix everything. And it's really hard because that's not really your job. And it was really important for me and it was a learning process and the VSBA helped me with it. It's like, you're up here, you're high level, you know, you're not operational. And that's a tricky one because people want to be operational. And one of the things that I've worked hard to do in my community is educate the public about what our jobs are. Because you wouldn't believe how many people will come up to you and say, I, I, I won't even give you any specific examples, but something very inappropriate about what they want you to do. And you're just like, that's really not my job. Please email the principal or email the teacher or email the superintendent. Um, but they don't understand. They really think that you are going to be um, have your hands in the weeds making these changes and that's really not your job. So it's been really helpful for them to work with our board as to what it is we should be doing and not doing. And I, Phil Gore came and helped us this summer at a retreat and that was wonderful. So um, that's just my perspective. Uh, I wanted to share it with you. And thank Sue and Sandra. Thank you, Senator Dealey. Uh, what do school board members get paid? That varies by the district, district the, from um, zero <laughs> to. Zero. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some school board members get paid, you know, uh, thousand bucks. For maybe, years. yeah, or five hundred. You know, it, it varies, but it's not um, not very much. Yeah. It's approved by the voters of each district. I, don't know, I think this is accurate. You know, a school board race in the city of Los Angeles can cost somebody like hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe a million bucks to get elected. Mm -hmm. Overseeing LA public schools. It's, it's a big job, big campaign. It's a big job here. But I don't know, I wish we could round more people up who are interested in doing it. That's for sure. Yeah, that's, we're always uh, working on that. So if you have any <laughs> ideas, we're Happy to hear them. Yeah, get off the brochure maybe. That's mm -hmm. my only thought. You know, maybe we do kind of move away from the brochure and kind of do some kind of work ads on social media. Mm -hmm. You know, hire some young guy or something to get it out there a little bit. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I, my, my, sorry. I said no, please. My observation is that folks tend to run when things aren't going well, but as long as things are running smoothly, they it's tend to just sort of you know, um, we have to, I, I will be actively going out trying to recruit someone to take, to run in my position, you know, most yeah. likely. So, yeah. Anything else? Just, uh, you can come in with many demands. That's but if you have a magic wand, uh, knowing the limited amount of time that this committee has to work on important issues, 
Which ones do you think would be the most important to, to work on? Yeah, I th well, I, I'm hoping that you could work on all three that I mentioned, which is the mental health and the facilities and um, addressing the equity issues for um, the Carson be making decisions. Actually, along that line, I, I assume you uh, testify in front of other uh, committees. Yes. Is your list different for other committees? No. Or is the list consistent? No, the list is uh, okay. consistent. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So we uh, budgeted a little bit too much time for this, uh, which is great. So we get a little bit of a break before uh, Beth is going to join us a little early. She's going to join us at 2.45. So people have you know, 15 minutes or so to stretch their legs and make a phone call. Welcome back to Senate Education, Wednesday, January 18th, 2.47. We are jumping in uh, on Acts 60 and 68, and I've asked uh, Beth St. James to give us an overview of the legislation, uh, how it started, kind of a historical perspective, and some of the impacts that um, we've seen from that. So with that, I'll just pass the the time to you and get started. Great. Thank you, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, as Chair Campion said, I, this is, presentation is meant to be very foundational and basic. Um, you will see that there are dates in here from the 90s and the early 2000s. Do we have a copy of that? Do you have a copy of that? I do. Oh, you do. That's right. Yeah. Did you already pass it out? It's in the updated report. Great. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, Thank you. This is meant to be foundational and relatively simple to orient you. Um, my understanding is you will eventually have someone from JFO coming in and doing school uh, education financing 101. Is that accurate? We point? did some education financing 101 with Brad James yesterday. OK. Yeah. Um, well, then hopefully um, this will help. And if you do have anyone from JFO come in, um, this will hopefully be, again, foundational. Great. Um, if you have questions that I am not... Um, I just want to make sure everybody sees they, it is in the staple packet if you need it. Uh, so it should only be six pages. Great. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Please go ahead. Um, this is, uh, presentation is really meant to just highlight um, what the state was doing before a seminal case called Brigham v. State, and then the... Uh, kind of fallout from Brigham and the legislative action that came from it. I'm not prepared today to discuss education funding as it exists today. Okay? All on the same page? Okay. It's a very scary subject. Um, so, if you want to turn to uh, table two, or, uh, slide two. So the case we're going to be talking about today is Brigham uh, v. State. And it's referred to as Brigham. And that happened in 1997. So this slide two is what what was in effect before Brigham, okay? And the state um, funded its education through what was referred to as the foundation plan. So the state set a foundation property tax rate annually, which was meant to be a reasonable rate of local property taxation that was supposed to raise enough money to cover the foundation amount or cost, which was the minimum needed to provide a minimum quality uh, of education, and that concept was set by the state. Let me just make sure. Yeah, we're on slide two. Yeah, slide two. Okay. So um, the state set a property tax rate, the purpose, and it was annual, and the purpose of that property tax rate was to raise enough money to provide a minimum quality of education, and that concept was defined by the state. If based on the grand list of the school district or town, the municipality that we're talking about, um, if based on uh, that grand list and the foundational property tax rate, if a school district was not able to raise um, enough, the state provided a grant to get them to that minimum uh, 
the foundation amount, the foundation cost, what, what the state decided would be needed to provide a minimum quality of education. I'm seeing some confusion. Is everyone? This is. So what, why wouldn't they, why wouldn't they uh, raise their own revenue sufficient to maintain their own schools? Are you talking about the towns? Yes. Let's get into the example. Okay. okay. So remember, this is foundational, right? This is the base, yeah. base floor, okay? So an example, um, we've got an example town, and the foundation amount that the state says you need to provide a minimum education is $5,000 per pupil, okay? The base tax rate that the state has set is 1%, and the grand list in this town is $400,000. So they, don't hit that five thousand. So we understand the grant list they can get okay. Yes. Okay. The, the property in your town is the um, taxable property in your town. And that what the property that is taxed will change a little bit as a follow-up to this. But for this conversation for the foundation plan and the grant list. So they can't raise based on the minimum tax rate, right? and the, the, the property they have to tax, they can only raise $4,000. So the state comes in and says, okay, we're gonna give you $1,000 to bump you up to that, to get you to that 5,000, which is the minimum necessary to educate people. All on the same page? No? No, for the slow student. Um, no, no, this is good. No, so, no, I'm glad you're asking so what prevents the town from increasing the base tax rate, or is that determined outside the town? Slide three. Okay, so this is, remember, this is, um, this is what used to happen, okay? And so this is just a very, on slide two, this is not about choice. This is just setting the foundation for what is the foundation plan. That's literally what it's called. It's providing a minimum level of uh, uh, education for students. So on slide three, now we're looking at um, equity here. Okay, so you've got two towns, one with lots of property wealth and one with little property wealth. Both towns want to spend $10,000 per people. Okay, they're making a choice that for their students. So the state isn't saying you should, the state isn't saying this is what's gonna educate a kid at the ten, the this is what they're state, deciding. The state is saying the base foundation to provide the minimum necessary education for students in the state of Vermont is five grand per student. These two towns are making a choice. They're saying, well, we want to invest in our education. We want to spend 10,000 per pupil. Where does, how do they get that money? So we've got a property poor town with a grand list of 400,000 and a property rich town with a grand list of a million, okay? And we've got that 1% tax rate that the state is saying. We're looking at everyone to get everyone kind of on the same page at that minimum amount. We're gonna say the tax rate is, is uh, 1% for the state. So the property poor town can still only raise $4,000 on their grant list. The state's gonna kick in $1,000 as the foundation grant to get them up to that minimum necessary. And so then they're only at 5,000 at that 1% tax rate. If you look at the property rich town at that 1% tax rate, they can raise that $10,000 without having to raise their taxes or receiving money from the state from that foundation grant. <laughs> the property poor town could choose to raise its tax rate to make up that difference to get to that $10,000 per people. That's what's in the green. That's what's in the green, yes. But you've got two towns with different um, resources in their grand lists and the property that they have to tax in that town, making the same decision to spend money on their education. And that affects their community differently. It affects their tax rates very differently and it may affect um, the choices that they're making on education spending, right? Do they wanna raise their tax rate to go up to that $10,000? Or 
or do they want to keep their tax rate low and hover around that that foundation um, uh, the the foundation formula for the minimum necessary to provide education all on the same page okay so this was that was the foundation plan that was what was in place prior to 1997 then we go to slide four. We're back with our friend, the Vermont Constitution. The education clause. You should all be expert scholars on this by now. The Vermont Constitution says that a competent number of schools ought to be maintained in each town unless the General Assembly permits other provisions to the convenient uh, construction of youth. That's it. That's it. That is That's it. I will note, as the Brigham Court notes, it's not on the slide, but I'll just note this. Education is the only government service that is in the Vermont Constitution. So there was no provision for um, roads, health care, health care, providing health for care. Um, the vulner vulnerable populations. Um, education is the only government service provided for in the Constitution. Then there's also the Common Benefits Clause, which I think we touched on a little bit when we talked about Carson v. Macon. And that says the government is or ought to be instituted for the common benefit, protection, and security of the people, nation, or community, and not for the particular um, emolument or advantage of any single person, family, or set of persons who are a part only of that community, right? So government is for all. So. Government is for all. No. Government is for all. Whatever. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. We've got, remember our foundation plan, right? Where we talked, we were, where there was the property rich town who could keep that 1% tax rate and raise $10,000 per pupil. But we have a, a property poor town could only raise 4,000 on its own. Well, that concerns some people. And they filed suit. There were actually three different classes of plaintiffs in this case. Just for your, uh, I know there were some questions last time I was here about could a, a, a tax um, payer sue. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight for your interest, there were three different uh, classes of plaintiffs here. There were students who alleged that the state's method of financing public education deprived them of their right under the Vermont Constitution of the same educational opportunities to students who lived in wealthier school districts. So these students lived in a, a town with not as much property to tax. And they said, hey, my neighbors in the town next to me with a whole bunch of property to tax, yeah. they have different educational opportunities to me than me, that's not fair. There were property owners from property poor districts who said, who claimed that the current school financing system compelled them to contribute more than folks in a town that just happened to have a lot of property. And then there were two school districts who had kind of the same argument that the um, there they were claiming that they didn't have the sufficient ability to raise money and provide their students with educational opportunities that um, richer towns could. So those three groups of plaintiffs were all kind of bundled up together, just um, highlighting that to show you the different classes of people who were concerned about the education financing. For reasons that we will not go into today, the court really only focused on the students' complaints. And um, so you can kind of ignore the, the property owners and school districts. And the students basically said, again, okay, Town next to us, this is very fair. different educational opportunities. Yes. To work in yes. yes. Equity. It's about equity. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, the court held that. Um, so the plaintiffs are saying that the foundation plan violated the Vermont Constitution by creating inequities between property rich towns and property poor towns. And ultimately, the Supreme Court held that the education financing system in place at the time, so the foundation plan that we just went over with those graphs, and this is a direct quote, with its substantial dependence on local property taxes and resultant wide disparities in revenues available to local school districts, deprived children of an equal educational opportunity in violation of both the Education Clause and the Common Benefits Clause of the Vermont Constitution. And in doing this analysis, the court really focused on the history of um, 
the Vermont Constitution and the fact that education was the only government service provided for in the education and what that means to being integral, integral to um, Vermont and the functioning of the state and the government's responsibility for providing education. Um, so there was the state was arguing, yeah, we're, we're going to concede that this isn't really fair. But this is a local issue. This isn't a state issue. So this is not the students suing their school districts. This is the students suing the state, right? So the state was saying, mm, yeah, it's not, not really equal here. But this is a local issue. And, and that means that you know we should let it be a local issue. And the Supreme Court said, no. Providing for education in the state of Vermont is enshrined in the Constitution. It's the only government service provided for in the Constitution. Is actually a state responsibility, not local. Funding of it doesn't take away from the fact that local decisions can be made, but the requirement that education is provided equally, right, under the Common Benefits Clause, substantially, the court says substantially equally. Um, competent schools, competent education. Yes, is that? Let's see. Uh, let's see. Competent number of schools. Yep. Uh, enough to support the population. Yeah. Um, so the court said, no state, this is your responsibility. So to fulfill its constitutional obligation, the state must ensure substantial equality of educational opportunity throughout Vermont. Now the Constitution does not say how the state should do that, right? Constitution says state you have to provide for it, the education of Vermonters, but it doesn't say how that education system should be funded. That the court emphasized is the legislature's purview. So the Vermont Constitution is silent on how this obligation, the educational obligation, must be funded. And they said, although the legislature should act under the Vermont Constitution to make educational opportunity available on substantially equal terms, the court was realistic in recognizing that they were never going to create a system, or the legislature was never going to create a system that was perfectly equal for every student, right? There's variations, there's going to be variations, so the requirement is substantially equal. So the specific means of Discharging that duty is up to the legislature. So the, the Constitution does not require the education system to be funded on property taxes, it does not require a foundation plan, it doesn't require uh, pupil waiting. It leaves that up to the legislature to decide, but the legislature has to make, in whatever system they come up with, has to provide for stand, substantially equal educational opportunities for Vermonters. Any questions about Brigham? Okay, this is, and I should say, this was a case that was decided by the Vermont Supreme Court in 1997. It's still good law. You will hear the, the you will, I don't know if Brad talked about Brigham at all or when it touched on Brigham, but when you're talking education finance, if you're talking any sort of history, there's always a reference to Brigham. So this is the case that we're referring to. Does anybody have any questions at this point before we go post-Brigham? Okay. okay. So post-Brigham, last slide. The legislature had some work to do. And the first thing they did was in 1997, they passed Act 60, which I know you have all heard because you've asked me about it. So Act 60 was the legislature's initial response to the Brigham decision. It did not change the way education spending is determined. Education spending is still a local decision under Act 60, but it moved funding of education from local funding to state funding and created the Ed Fund, which funds all of those districts. It created a uniform tax rate across the state supported a minimum block grant, and any spending above the block, block grant resulted in a higher tax rate for that town. Um, 
And so I have a little example here. And anything raised above, um, uh, any revenues raised went into a state level share, uh, state level share pool to be redistributed based on spending. So um, if you have town A, let's say they have um, $1,500 of property value per pupil, and town B has $500 of property value per pupil, but they both want to spend $1,000 in per pupil spending above the state block grant. Both towns have the same tax rate because they're spending that they want to spend the same amount of money. So the tax rate is correlated to spending now. Town A is going to generate $1,500 per pupil, but they only needed to raise $1,000 more than that block grant. So they've got a little slush there, and they've got $500 in excess. That's going to go into the education fund because town B can only generate an extra $500 per pupil. So they're $500 per pupil short of what they want to spend on their kiddos. And that money is going to come from the education fund. And that's funded through the excess. There's, there's other funds in there that we're not going to get into for this presentation. Um, but it's partially funded by that extra $500 from town A. So they made a choice to spend the same amount on their students, which means they have the same tax rate. That tax rate is applied to their grant lists, property that they have there. And if they needed that money, the money would, you know, help to help spend their per, per people spending. And if they didn't need that money because it was an excess, it would go to the education fund to help out all of the towns that couldn't raise money on their own uh, grant lists. So it's tying, X60 is really tying the property tax to education spending. Quick question, I guess it's just semantics, but is the block grant pretty much the same as the foundation amount prior to the Brigham decision? Yeah, uh, for the purposes of this conversation, let's say yes. It's okay. a, it's a, uh, it was set annually in statute um, and it was the amount of money that the state was going to kick in um, per pupil for education um, across the state. Okay. I don't know if the, the math was the same, mm -hmm. um, but the, for this conversation. Got it. Okay. And it took several years for this to actually be implemented. I think the full implementation goal was 2001. And then in 2003, Act 68 moved us a lot closer to um, what you see today. And the big takeaways for Act 68 are it split the grand list into homestead and non-homestead property. And there's different tax rates for those now. That was not the case prior to um, Act 68. So it created a homestead property tax rate that varied again based on education spending and then it created a non-residential tax rate that was uniform across the state, which means it didn't change based on local education spending decisions. And it also made uh, the town's education uh, property tax rate proportional to the spending approved by its residents, not on spending above the block grant approved by all towns. So it was really tied to the community itself, Sinners. not a statewide decision. So just to confirm, Act 68 basically got rid of this system developed by Act 60? No, it, uh, it um, amended the system. Okay. So the big difference in Act 68 was the splitting of the homestead and the non-homestead property tax rates. So under Act 60, every property in um, the community is taxed at the same rate for educational purposes. Residential homes and vacation homes, or not, just non-residential homes in general. And then Act 68 created? Split them. Got it. So now, under current state law and under Act 68, 
the homestead property tax rate is going to vary depending on education spending. And what that looks like today, I assume Brad either went over or you're going to have JFO come in and do that. Um, but it's, big, it's, it's it varies based on education spending. But the non-residential tax rate is not affected by educational spending. It's the same no matter where you are. Um, and those are, those are the big takeaways for Act 60 and 68 and Brigham to kind of orient you to um, where we are today. A lot has happened since then. Uh, if you can take the, um, the non-residential tax rate issue to the next step, was it intended to be uh, lower, higher? I'm, I have no, I'm not a vacation homeowner. Um, so tax questions, I would really encourage you to reach out to the attorney who's uh, I'm just, just the yeah. philosophy of it in, in uh, 2003. So I don't know about the intent behind the splitting of that, but again, for tax questions, that is not my area of expertise. So the, the fallout from that and what that meant for non-residential homeowners um, would really be a question directed for Abby Shepard. Um, but for purposes of our conversation, Act 68 was the thing, the piece of legislation that made that split. Tax and education funding go hand in hand. And um, my ability to speak to it really stops if it's not in Title 16. And all of the tax concepts are in Title 32, and that is Abby Shepard's area of expertise. And I did reach out to her. She knows I was presenting on this, and she knows she may get some questions Great. on this. Is there a oh, thank you. Could somebody today say, could a kid or a family say, listen, my child went through school district B and he or she came out of school district B not being able to you know, read at grade level, do math at grade, that kind of thing, and say, okay, we've got a problem. Or my kid, maybe a better way to do it is, my kid just doesn't have the same opportunities in terms of classes that you know another school has in terms of offerings and we're going to try to set this record straight could that kind of lawsuit happen today yes my standard question anytime anyone asks me if any type of lawsuit could happen is always yes because anyone can sue anyone for anything yeah. at any time any place doesn't mean they're going to be successful yeah so there have been lawsuits um there is a there is a case that's in the Vermont Supreme Court now that we're waiting on a decision on any day that does make an argument under the Common Benefits Clause that, that um, children in school districts that have a brick and mortar school are not getting the same benefit under the Common Benefits Clause of a student who lives in a town school district that doesn't have a brick and mortar school because they get, that student in the town district, the tuitioning district, gets to go anywhere they want. Yeah. They get to hand pick that those courses. Yeah. They get to hand pick those extracurricular activities. Um, and the students who are growing up in a town with a school don't. They are, unless their parents want to pay for them to go somewhere else, um, they have the opportunities available in their school district. Um, so yeah. No, it's good that you're bringing this up because I've followed this case a little bit. So what is, so tell us a little bit more in terms of, is it the family looking to sort of expand their opportunities or are they concerned that different areas have opportunities that so they might not? There's two types of challenges that can be might brought to a law. Yep. Um, I think I'm, maybe I'm missing what you're saying. Um, to go back to answer your original question, um, yes, a, a, someone could say, that because they have different opportunities in their school district than someone else, um, the educational opportunities are unequal. It would right. really depend on, in every case, the facts of the case, right? Yeah. Um, but what is their argument? Are they saying that it's because of educational funding? Mm -hmm. Is it because they're, it's the choices that the school board is making? Right. Is it, so it really, it is really it depends. Is it the state that's not requiring certain exactly, things to be right, offered? Exactly, right, right, right. So, um, but yes, there, there could be, and I think there have been, 
I don't want to speak out of turn. I think there have been various um, arguments that have bubbled up here and there of students arguing, families arguing, students arguing that um, uh, their school didn't provide enough extracurriculars or it wasn't fair that their school didn't have the same extracurricular opportunities as another school district. Um, and none of those cases have really had traction yet. Hmm. Um, but the um, case that I was referring to that's in the Vermont Supreme Court now, um, there's kind of two different challenges that um, someone can make on a law. There's as applied and there's facial. So as applied means the law has been applied to me and that application, there's something wrong with it. It's, it's unconstitutional. Um, they didn't actually follow the law. As the law was applied to me specifically, um, that, you know, something illegal happens there. I deserve a remedy here. I deserve a fix. And then there's a facial challenge, which means that the law in and of itself is not okay. And that would invalidate it potentially for everyone. This, the case that we're talking about from the Vermont Supreme Court was a facial challenge. So they're arguing in general for all of Vermonters. Um, it's not fair that some students get the optional tuition and some don't because the right to education is foundational in Vermont's constitution yeah. and it's a common benefit. So there's an, they're arguing that there's an equity issue there. So could the court come back and say, okay, we're going to give choice to the state or could the court come back and say, the choice that exists is going to disappear or of something else? The court is not going to, so the court could come back and say this scheme is unconstitutional like they did in Brigham. Right. But it's up to the legislature to find, to, a, solution. To find a solution or not find a solution and then face another legal challenge yeah. and another legal challenge. Um, but yes, the, the, the court is very unlikely to come back with a roadmap for exactly what the legislature should do. That's the legislature's purview to make make the laws. The court interprets them. But that, I'm checking every day, every Friday when opinions are issued because that's an interesting one to follow. Yeah. But that is not related to, it's not directly on point to Brigham, although they relied on Brigham a lot in their arguments. Um, it, is, it is an equity argument under the educational clause and the common benefits clause. It's just not directly specific to educational funding. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yeah, please. Uh, going backwards to the Vermont Constitution, just, just curious, um, uh, really no language on uh, what ages that the school requirement yeah. should be applied to. How do they ever determine that? And, and are there challenges now in, in respect to earlier or later education? You determine that, the legislature. Um, so in Vermont, attendance in a school is compulsory between the ages of six and 16. Um, in Vermont, uh, kindergarten entrance age, you have to be five by August 31st of the school year. Um, between August 31st and um, December 31st of the school year, but a school district can make the entrance age anywhere in there. Um, so there are some school districts who say you have to be five by August 31st, and there are some school districts who say you have to be five by a different, a different um, date. I don't know off the top of my head if anyone actually goes all the way out to December 31st, which means that, um, kiddos could be starting kindergarten at age four um, if they don't have to turn five until late September, October, November. And then um, on the other end, um, it's compulsory only at age of 16. I should mention, if people are interested, uh, Senator, former Senator Nifta put in a bill last year or the year before that said enough of the 16 thing it should really be 18. And I, we did get a lot of pushback. I mean, we never really, we took a little testimony, but we heard from people, it wasn't a good idea for a variety of different reasons, but I'm happy to explore that again. Um, yeah. 
just to add, I was just yeah. going to add to the kindergarten discussion. This was something we talked about in the BSBA over the summer, um, or maybe it was the fall, but um, just because we were asked if we if we thought we needed legislation around a more specific date for kindergarten entry, or if we wanted it to change, or if the, or if the BSBA wanted to weigh in on it. And I think in the end, we just decided to sort of leave it as is, um, which is there is some flexibility there. But some states are really strict, for like January 1st or, you know. Yeah, no, that's, that's really not where I was going. I was right. really kind of yeah. more interested in the early education, mm -hmm. early childhood education. And then, you know, uh, post high school. If there was ever an attempt or whatever to uh, modify that. What was the argument about sixteen? I don't remember why. You know why we didn't move it up to eighteen? Yeah. I don't. Do you remember any of that conversation? I, I don't I, know that I've been a part of any. Yeah, of I, I remember like when that. it was. Uh, I think really, what are you going to do if a kid wants to leave? Kind of thing. I mean, what kind yeah, of no, kids sitting there, ready to some, be done. you know, yeah. ready to be done? It's but um, happy to pull that conversation no, back up if people are interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's also yeah. kids who uh, finish school early and go to college early. Yeah. There's that, yeah, super yeah. Often, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and there, there are provisions for like if a student matriculates early, they're not true, if they're right. if they have fulfilled certain requirements, and then. Pre-K, early childhood education is different. It's um, provided for differently than the rest of the education system in Vermont. Do you want to add something to that? No, I was just curious where that was going. Uh, constitutionally, pre-K, I mean, I, I, I'm I, just I, curious of the boundaries. Um, I don't have uh, an answer for that. Um, I don't know constitutionally, um, you know, the Constitution doesn't spell out what ages the state is responsible for providing. That's fine. Nobody's ever asked it before. So, <laughs> shh, put it back to that. There's no there's a cool thing called early college too, which we haven't talked about. Right, we've got some time on flexible yeah. pathways. And That's early, neat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This is this uh, this is really helpful. Yeah, yeah. Let's give us a. You can get a back. lot more detail on this. Act 68 sure. specifically was a huge bill, and it did a yeah. lot of things. Yeah. Um, but this was just meant to just be very basic, foundational, and really to orient you to Brigham and the. The constitutional requirement for the state to provide education for its students in a substantially equal way for funding. Local decisions can still be made around spending and curriculum and all of that under current law. And you all, as the legislature, get to decide what that looks like. Anything else? Okay. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Beth. Thank, Thank you. you. That's really helpful. <laughs> We'll come back in five minutes for Christine Holquist, and here's a copy of the bill that we're going to be looking at uh, right after Christine talks to us, and we'll be done by 4.15, I would think. Yeah. Thanks. Welcome back to Senate Education, Wednesday, January 18, 3.35. We're going to hear from uh, Christine Holquist. Executive Director of Vermont Community Broadband Board, uh, and uh, we'll be in it just a moment. We're live, just so you know. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah, absolutely. And there's Mr. Fish. Can you hear us, Rob? Oh. I can hear you. Okay. The irony if this doesn't work. <laughs> it's not. <that's>... <laughs> <laughs> And is uh, Christine joining you? Uh, I had assumed that she was already on. Uh, let me find out. Oh, she's joining now. Let me turn the volume up a little bit. Nice background. Yeah, yeah, I like that. So this is the, the fiber that was delivered to the, the whack yard um, over the summer. Ms. Holquist, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Thanks. Thanks for uh, having us. 
Yeah, thank you both for joining us. Uh, so the reason, of course, we're interested in, in learning how the CUDs and, and broadband expansion are going generally, but with a particular eye towards schools and, of course, families, uh, kids who are at home, if they ever needed to be home again as a re you know, for COVID or some other unforeseen situation that may hit us in the future. But our eye, of course, is toward education and, uh, you know, toward what I just sort of outlined. So I just want to give you, the two of you, the, the floor. Tell us where things are at generally in the state, and then we can talk specifically about education. And yeah, I thank you. But I would add too that it's not you know we'll get to it later in the slides, but it's it's not just about the school itself, right? It's also about access to knowledge, you know. So we're we're going to talk yeah. to about our our digital equity plan and how people who are on the other side of the digital divide are at a disadvantage because they don't you know you, you think about what we use our internet for, especially with this if you're familiar with this chat NGP program that's out that can actually write papers for you. You know that the world is a, so entrenched in the digital world these days. So we'll talk about all that. Thank you. And Great. of course, it's our favorite topic. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Rob, Rob's going to uh, run the slides. Um, okay. We'll kind of give you a status of where we are uh, and uh, how, why it's important to the communities, and and uh, we'll take it from there. So of course, uh, it's Rob and I. We actually have a a. a a, a pretty good staff right now and and our staffing is important in terms of future funding the actual broadband equity access and deployment program which is part of the uh, the infrastructure investment and jobs act you know we could look at could be looking at hundreds of millions of dollars but they want to make sure that we have a strong staff so I'll, I'll talk about what we've done in order to put that in place next slide okay person's everybody seeing the full screen right now yes I'm we seeing are. It, yes okay um, for some reason, not having my controls when I'm sharing this. Speaking of technology problems here. I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to switch this, and it's it's not showing my screen for the presentation side of things. Huh. It was showing for us. Fine. Hayden, I wonder if – I hate to put this on. Hate, I, unfortunately, I'm running, a, I'm running a Linux computer, so I mine won't show up right yeah, it's showing up. I just can't switch between the slides, but uh, you got it, Hayden. Thank you. All right, Hayden's got it. Thank you. All right, perfect. <laughs> All right, so talking about the mission, uh, you know, I, I'll put this in our words. There's we have three main uh, main missions. One is to get everybody connected, and as you'll hear, we believe we've got the funding and the planning to get everybody connected. The next step is to make it affordable, and that's the challenge we're working on right now. And one of the ways to address affordability is to get as much grant funding as possible, because every $50 million we receive in grant funding, we can reduce the cost by $10 to the end customer. Um, and then the third component, which is the component I'm sure the Education Committee wants to focus on, is maximizing positive social impact. And what I'm proud to say and happy to say is that is also the goal of the funders. You know, we have $62.5 billion available from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Equity is an important component of the planning. Uh, as, the, uh, as the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, who's managing the funds, says, bead without equity is bad. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just hit, hit some of the highlights, the main focus series in 2022. You know, our focus in 2020 was to, to 22 was to build capacity. At the beginning of the year, you know, that was Rob and I. Uh, today, we have a pretty robust staff. We have a, a an engineering function. We, we have a financial function. Uh, we have a, um, you know, the whole legal function as well. Uh, and this is all really uh, put in place through Act 71. Act 71 was a very innovative piece of legislation. It really has become the envy of a number of states throughout the country are trying to to uh, to copy copy what we're doing. Uh, you know, we have several years ahead of them uh, in terms of carrying this out. But you know, it, uh, Nebraska is the latest state that's trying to do uh, mimic what we've done. We are leading the country. Um, the NTIA has stated that to our board in terms of everything we're doing here. So I certainly want to thank the legislature for a very uh, well constructed constructed piece of legislation. And speaking of construction, 
Um, Rob will give you a little more detail, but we're providing funds today and, and we're constructing and getting people connected. And then the, the other part of our job is to make sure that uh, we, we have the accountability in place and we monitor the performance. You know, we've, we've got outside uh, uh, plant specifications that, that the uh, providers need to comply with. And of course, we've got the communication union districts that are gonna hold the providers accountable. Next slide, please. So as we talked, you know, in 2023, you need more than a good school for a good education. I talked a little bit about that. You know, it's not just, you know, access when, when they can't get to school. Of course, we, you know, with, with all the uh, illness that's going around today, you know, I'm very pleased that, you know, we can have a virtual office because, you know, when I've got a fever, I can sit here in front of my computer and the computer won't won't catch what I got, um, but we can continue to function. So, so productivity in the work world is shown to increase significantly. When we talk about school age, you know, education and training, and even into the area of career technical education, having those resources available, the knowledge available, uh, is uh, is critical. And I, you know, I just finished reading a recent study about, uh, you know. China's education a few years ago was the envy of the world. Now it's no longer the envy of the world because knowledge is becoming a commodity. And it really is about creativity and collaboration, which is important because knowledge can be accessed uh, no matter where you are, assuming that you're connected. So this is, this I, I wanna emphasize how important it is not only be connected while you're, while you're in school, it's while you're out of school, and even that ties down to some of our technical challenges. For example, you know, we're working with a housing and urban development uh, organizations throughout the state, housing organizations. And you know, some of these uh, multi-dwelling units are provided but through cable and the kids come home from school and all of a sudden they don't have the bandwidth they need. So even down to the technical specification to ensure that that equal opportunity for all uh, doesn't, isn't restricted by by your ability to pay. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. Thank you, Christine. Um, I'm gonna take a, a few moments to go over what's happening around the state right now, but I just wanna echo what Christine said is, the, the, the walls of the school building is not where education ends anymore, it's the entire community. So that's where our focus comes in. And when it comes to educational equity, there's only so much you can control at the home. One thing you can control and to assure is equal is providing providing ubiquitous fiber access to, to all students. And that would be our goal here. Uh, the legislature decided that our implementation mechanism is primarily gonna be these entities, these are municipalities that are called communication union districts. Uh, this provides both construction, but also oversight and accountability for what is happening and a way for the community to respond. Uh, during during COVID, during the worst of COVID, I'll leave it at that, uh, these entities were incredibly important for identifying Wi-Fi hotspots, for communicating with the superintendents of the schools, for pro providing access and documenting problems. And that's only continued as we moved into the phase of where we're constructing permanent infrastructure. We're not, into, we're not looking at interim solutions right now. Um, I'm happy to report now that Five of the districts are in the construction phase, uh, including Southern Vermont, which has partnered with Consolidated Orphidium Fiber. And as of now, they're planning to have the entire district built out by the end of this calendar year. Uh, there's also construction happening up in the Kingdom, Central Vermont, uh, Maple Broadband in Addison County, uh, Deerfield Valley connected their first customers a few days ago, which is exciting. Uh, and then EC Fiber, the, the original CUD. Uh, we've now reached the point, though, that 214 of Vermont's towns are members of communication union districts. Each one of these towns has two representatives to the board. This covers 76% of the state's population and 93% of the, the unserved areas. We're, we're making progress. We're excited for the next year. And during the next year, we believe that the other CUDs will also be beginning construction. Uh, next slide. But we not, are not only focusing on CUDs. They're our primary method for delivering service, but we, if you don't live in a CUD, you still need to get service. And we're happy to report that elsewhere in the state, 
stuff is happening. Uh, starting in the north, I'm going to fill in some of the holes here. Uh, Town of Fletcher has a uh, received a grant from the Northern Borders Regional Commission to build out fiber to the premise. Uh, I believe that Consolidated is also going to be building out fiber in that area this year. Heading south, we've been working closely with Waitsfield Champlain Telecom. Uh, they received a grant this summer to connect their, the addresses that aren't on fiber will be moved to fiber in a phased approach. Uh, further south there, you have the various areas that are TDS. So this is uh, Ludlow and Perkinsville. They have plans to build nine, fiber to 90% of their customers. Uh, they're in the they're in the contracting phase at this point, but I believe that that's going to be launched this summer. Uh, then you have the VTEL area where the, the it's they report serving their addresses with fiber. And then uh, back to Southern Vermont here, even the small town of small Gore of Glastonbury uh, is now connected with fiber. There's I think it's six or eight residents now. Uh, so we're making progress on a statewide level uh, through the CUDs and, and beyond. So um, next slide. Uh, quickly, I want to talk about the funding out the, out the door. It's no use holding on to the funds when they have the capacity, have the accountability, and have the skills to move forward. We want to be getting those funds out the door. We've already distributed um, $122 million in funding. And uh, this slide actually doesn't include the other about 2.3 2 million that we approved last week. Our board meets monthly now. It had been uh, every other week for about four hours. And uh, we put these groups through the ringer to make sure that they, they have the skills, they have the expertise, have the accountability to, to get it done, to meet design standards, and to ensure that we are gonna be having 100 by 100 service statewide. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I, you know, I touched on this before, you know, the, uh, afford a, the, uh, the challenge of providing service to the unserved areas today is they're the areas that are the most expensive to serve. So, you know, uh, we've got the areas that are most expensive to serve are also the ones that can least afford it. So if you look at the Northeast Kingdom, for example, NEK Broadband has 57 towns in its, in its communication union district. And if you overlay energy burden, uh, that, you know, people are struggling up there. So we're going to continue to reinforce, the, you know, that we we need to get as much grant funding as possible in order to, uh, uh, and in order to keep, right, to make it affordable. So it, grants and creative financing, we're doing a tremendous amount of work to look at different ways we can finance this. For example, one of the low, there's low, if we have to go to the bond market, you know, we're going to look for low, low cost bond funding, for example, ESG bonds, environmental, social, and uh, governance bonds. We really hit hit the mark on that. You know, from an environmental standpoint, um, providing uh, reliable connections not only is help the smart grid in order to increase the penetration of renewables, it also enables customers to take advantage of special pricing programs to lower their cost of energy, as well as uh, improve the, the grid's ability to ab absorb uh, new renewables. So those are the kind of the creative financing, the ways we're trying to attack this thing. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, Christine, this might be a good opportunity to talk about the Middle Mile program. And oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, I I'll talk about that. Yeah, so we also, uh, thanks Rob. We also uh, applied, for a, uh, a grant program that this, the federal government is offering a billion dollars and they're gonna make 10 to 15 grants available. That means they're pretty significant grants. Initially, we looked at that and say, you know, you know, how can Vermont compete with all these other states? But we, the reason we, we are able to compete and we are able to create such a robust uh, application is because we are small and we all work together. So we're one of the, uh, the only states that put in an application that looks at the statewide network and has the major telecom providers participating with the program. The idea on the middle mile program is we are able to design a robust and resilient network, you know, with sub rings throughout the state with geographic redundancy. So if you lose connection because a tree fell on the east, the feed for the east, it'll feed for the west. So uh, pretty proud to say that. You know, we did a, a remarkable job of putting that together, and that would provide another 116 million dollars in funds should we win that grant. So uh, that is going to require a 30 million dollar match from the state. That'll be coming through from the Budget Adjustment Act, and we're actually testifying to the uh, 
Appropriations Committee on Friday about that. Okay, I want to talk about workforce development because this involves this the uh, career technical education uh, centers throughout the state. Uh, this so you know every problem is an opportunity. When we look at the project management of this program, you whenever you do a good project management, you look at the timeline and you say what are the key constraints. And one of the key constraints, of course, is getting the workforce to do this, because we know we need at least a minimum of 200 additional fiber optic technicians. And to get 200, you have to train 600, because you find people who can't work in the air, and, and, uh, and, and people don't like to work outside, those kind of things. So it, it was quite the challenge, right? But at the same time, it's quite the opportunity, because we can create a program that allow people to, work, to move from lower income jobs into the higher income uh, sector, and we, we're putting a career development program together with that. We're working with uh, Vermont Technical College, who's, who's really been key to this program, to you know, provide credits for the program. So people could even go on to become electrical mechanical engineers. They want to go into IT. They can use this program. And the idea is we'll pay people to get trained. And we've made arrangements with all the major telecom providers. As soon as they leave this program, they'll go right into a paid job. So we don't interrupt. We don't interrupt their pay. We have a pay it forward program where that you know they work X number of years for the uh, employer. That money gets paid back, so we can continue the program moving forward. Um, this has been a great collaboration, and uh, it will provide a great opportunity for for uh, folks in Vermont. And uh, we've spent a lot of time developing the training because it needs to be actually in a physically in a pole yard so people can work in the air. So we build a four-day training program. The first program will be offered in April during spring break for the schools, and we'll be beta testing it with the uh, CTE students, and uh, we'll, we'll be continuing to offer that uh, in into the future. Next slide, please. So, you know, digital divides the issue, equity is the goal, and inclusion is the work. Uh, this is about, you know, you get down to the basic constitution of what America is about, we're about providing equal opportunity for all. Today, that digital divide has really created a barrier for that equal opportunity. That barrier doesn't just exist in urban and rural as well, uh, because there are pockets, uh, there are urban pockets, and even including in Burlington, where that you know that the there isn't just that much money, so people don't get connected, you know, it, it, the way it's telecom has been done, because it's been done through the market, the market doesn't go where the money doesn't exist. And this program is all about addressing that issue and taking care of that uh, digital divide so everybody can be included and have an opportunity for a better future. Next slide, please. So anyway, we, we cranked through this so we could give you some time for questions. Uh, let's open it up for questions now. Great. You take that off. Uh, thank you both. That that was that was helpful. Uh, I'll just kick it off. I'm wondering if you're in connection with the agency of education to, to understand what schools really don't have access that need access. I mean, do you have a, a sense of that for your work with AOE? You know, as I present to this committee, yeah. You know, I was looking at the list. So we just had a digital equity kickoff, and uh, you know, and with. And we've been working, we, we spent the last two months reaching out to different organizations. And so, for example, we've got an advisory committee for this digital, we have a $518,000 digital equity grant from the federal government to build a five-year plan for inclusion. And that, you know, once we finish the plan, we'll get five years of funding for this. And, I'll, and we, we've reached out to the, you know, the Department of Libraries is on there, uh, Vermont Department of Disability, Aging, Independent Living, Rural Development, Racial Equity, you know, uh, refugees and immigrants, but the Department of Education is not on there. So as soon as I started presenting this committee, I realized we missed that. Okay. So you're going to work, you're going to include the Agency of Education in that group? Yes. That's actually right. And I, I, I took even before you mentioned it because I didn't realize. Okay. And, and I mean, we're talking to the CTEs, but we're not talking to the okay. schools. And we'll give the Agency of Education a heads up also, I believe the Education C, well, I'm not sure if they're in the room, but to, to help work with all of you to, again, understand what those what schools still need to be connected, what schools are out there. If we want to next year make sure that 
every kid can have, you know, I don't know, Chinese lessons with a native Chinese speaker, and it would have to be, you know, of course, online. Do those kids have that access? Right. Yeah, I agree. And I will tell you, some initial conversations we've had with some of the schools has been around, the focus has been around, you know, how can we get uh, a, a, an alternative and lower, lower cost provider for the CUDs? But, you know, that's just, that's not even tipping the iceberg. I, I like the challenge you just presented to us. Yeah, but I'll show you, we do, we do have that data. Um, we have data for every E911 address in the state. We're just not prepared today to to present that, but we can get that to you. Uh, we've been a little bit overwhelmed with the FCC challenge process to try to make sure we're bringing as much money to the state as possible. Yeah. Uh, recovering from that, and uh, the superintendents were incredibly helpful in getting word out, uh, as well as businesses around the state for the for the challenge process. But our our GIS person is a little bit overwhelmed, so we apologize for not having that today. But it is something we have to create for the digital equity process, and we'll certainly share that. No problem. So when you say you have that data, you're talking about what schools don't have access. Yes, the capabilities, the, the highest level of broadband speed available to each school. Great. When do you think you could, I understand you guys have been swamped with things. When do you think you might have that to us? When would it be just feasibly, you know, when is it possible? I think within the next few weeks, uh, I'm going okay. to try to, I'm going to try to under promise and over deliver here. I, I okay. <laughs> but Senator okay. Kempion, I, I think you, you raised the bar. I mean, I think we've got, you know, we, we've got that information, we provided that information, but I think you set the bar. I like where you set the bar in terms of, we talked about equity goes beyond the walls of the school. You know, what we want to make sure every, every student has the opportunity to, to learn Chinese, you know, as, as a, wherever they are. I think that's, you know, that's, that's where we want to go from an equity Woody standpoint. Yeah. There's the kind of that's and when you go to our three goals, con connected, affordable, and maximize social impact. We, you know, we think we've got the connectivity piece covered, but the maximize social impact is the challenge. Yeah. Other questions, please. Um, <clears throat> it's a good presentation. I'm just curious on the slide, which is communication union districts. If the, if the percentages indicated on the slide are uh, populations, for example, 76% of the, of the uh, state's population, is that 76% of the state's population is in a CUD or that the installation is complete? I'm not quite sure what the uh, metric is. is. Is a part of a CUD, is in a town okay. that's a member of a CUD. Okay, so, so kind of taking it to the next step, is there any kind of uh, programmatic graphic that shows when installations happen over time and, and what the percentage of the population is covered now versus next year versus the following year, et cetera? Is that? That's gonna, it's gonna vary from communication union district to district, depending on which business model they're pursuing. Uh, it's very likely the ones that are doing the, the public-private partnership where they're helping an existing provider may have the build out occur, occur faster, but it's gonna vary from district to district. Although uh, so you will be able to see that on our dashboard. We're, we're gonna, so uh, I, I don't know, you've, I think you've got that link in the presentation. We do, we're gonna be very, uh, very transparent and uh, provide accountability by, we're quarterly forecasting how many addresses are getting connected. And you'll be able to go to the dashboard and see our progress on a quarterly basis on who's getting connected, where, so, okay. So, where are you currently? Well, currently, we, you know, between uh, Southern Vermont and ADK and others, we've probably connected about eleven thousand addresses. But remember, last year was getting the CUDs up to building. Build. We, last year was about we had we focused on getting the designs in place, get you know, approving the business plan, issuing the grants, and getting the the CUDs staffed yeah. up to carry it out. So, you know, Rob. You're going to see much fat. This is the year to, of construction, right? Rob showed you that five of the 10 CUDs are actually in construction now, and the others are very close. Some of those are moving very fast. Once we get into construction, things can move fast. But the past year has been really about uh, building up the broadband offices. Make you know, we, we use an outside design firm, CTC, to review the designs. We review the business plans. They review the business plans. 
And we've issued, you know, we've now got grants issued to get the CUDs uh, constructing. We've also purchased materials ahead of time. One of the nice things uh, we discovered that, for example, fiber had a one year lead time. So we pre-purchased uh, the materials needed for the entire state. It was about a $7 million purchase, but because we did a collective purchase, we saved $2 million. So it's significant savings by doing that. And also, um, we so we've got everything in place to, to really uh, okay. hit, the, hit the boot ground running. And then and we, we encourage you to look at the, the dashboard that's linked in the presentation. The dashboard would be key. Got it. Uh, okay, so there's a few things we didn't share. That we didn't share in our underdevelopment at this point. If it's going to improve, because we transparency is important here. And especially as we enter the construction phase, you're going to start seeing things happen as opposed to this study was completed and we purchased this yeah. amount of paper. Yeah. So yeah. we're excited right. for this next year. All right, Senator, Senator Weeks has another follow-up. Uh, same slide, you say 93% of premises <laughs> statewide without, are without access to 25.3. What's 25.3? So, so 25, yeah, go ahead, yeah that's, the, that's the speed. Unfortunately, you know, 20, this, I, I don't want to get into too, too big a sinkhole here, but even that 25.3 is not reliable. Uh, no, 25.3 is, 25 is it, but it, 25.3 means you get 25 megabits down, three megabits up in terms of connection speed. And what that primarily means DSL, which is a technology, so they aren't even getting that. You might as well assume that 25.3 is not served. It's just poor, poor service. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot behind this. You know, unfortunately, we're in a battle with the telecom. We're not in a battle anymore. Consolidated has actually agreed. Um, Consolidated agreed that that 25.3 is not serviceable, and they probably don't get that. Yeah, just, just to back it up a little bit, so you have the download speed. So that's if you're if you're watching a video. If you're uploading a video, you're using that upload speed. So when it comes for all of the, anything with remote learning or having a, a class, a Chinese class taught by a native Chinese speaker, like that's where you need the that's where you need yeah. this. You need the upload speed, and, and you need and to Rob be symmetrical too. Yeah, when Rob talks about those, chi we'll, we'll use that. We'll stay with that example. Training in Chinese, you're not going to get that with 25.3. So that so the way to think about this, if you see 25.3, it's not adequate for for the needs of education and business. But you're saying here, 93% of premises statewide without access to 25.3. Yes. That's current state. That's currently. That's even worse. That's quite right. Better That's even worse. Yeah, yeah there, there's there's proposals out there to up the minimum broadband speed. Well, that's considered broadband is to 100 over 20. That's what most cable customers are receiving today. If you're on DSL or if you're on wireless connection, uh, maybe you're receiving 25.3. Most likely, it's more like 10.1. And there's a question of uh, how dependable that is. Anything else? I have a hundred questions, but I didn't yeah, think yeah, no, uh, we may have the two of you back. Actually, you know, we sort of just touched on it. Uh, maybe sometime next week for another thirty minutes. I think we all have some additional questions, but we have a witness waiting, and um, we need to move on. Yeah, that's that's good. We can have the data for you. That, that, that okay? Well, that'd be great. Okay, terrific. Yeah. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks for the overview, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing both of you soon. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. What confused me is when it says 93% of premises statewide are without access to 25.3, that seems very discouraging. But maybe yes. I miss. That's like copper. Right. Yeah. It's not fiber. Mm. Yeah. Okay. There's more to explore here. Right? Yeah. 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 But this seems like your wheelhouse, so that's good. Oh, yeah. Communications big time. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm completely ignorant. Not completely, but pretty big. Right. Uh, so. Good. Back. Okay. Yay.